Um, but I do want to begin with that letter on page 467. This was written, I did a talk to a, a group in Franklin when, beginning of September. And it ended up being about a three hour talk with questions on um, O'Connor's short story, Good Man is Hard to Find. So we could, I mean, we could easily go several class periods on this. I'm going to try and limit it to just two, today and Monday. But it's important to realize when, when O'Connor is writing, what are the ideas circling around in the ether at that time? Or what are the ideas circling around in the world? The, the, that aspect of setting. What is her setting? Okay? She writes this in 1953. She writes this in 1953. So what are the ideas, the major ideas, kind of moving around in the world? And, and you got a little bit about her introduction. She developed lupus. Her father died of lupus when he was a young man. 40, 41 years old. She develops lupus, and she's dead within, I think it is, six years, 10 years, something like that. She dies fairly young, um, 25 to 64. So she's 39 okay, when she dies. During that period, after she's an adult in writing, she writes primarily short stories. She writes a couple of novels, but... She's not really acknowledged as a great writer until after she dies, okay? which happens you know, all too often. So what are some of the philosophical ideas that are permeating the world in the 1950s, early 1950s? Well, let's talk very briefly. What has essentially just ended? World War II in 1945, right? 1953, a little spotty, because um, I don't know the exact date of the, of the, no, it's earlier than that. Korean War starts in 50. It might be over by 53, but I want to say it's, I think it's late 53 that it is. So she writes this and publishes it before the end of the Korean War, right? So we've had the Second World War, because bear in mind the First World War was called what? It wasn't called the First World War at the time. The Great War and the War to End All Wars. It was supposed to be complete. Okay? So, so let me back up just a little bit. The 19th century en ended and the 20th century began. In the 20th century, according to a lot of people, was supposed to inaugurate this great flowering of human civilization. It was going to be, according to the title of one journal that began being published very early in the 20th century, it was going to be the progressive century. And yes, that's progressive like used in today's politics, progressives. Okay? Maybe not as violent as progressives are. And the other one was the Christian century. Okay? Because it was thought that we were going to put it into war, we were going to put it into slavery. You know, the United States finally got its act together and did about 40 years after England. Still all kinds of other places practicing slavery, just as there are today. A lot of places practicing slavery, buying and selling of slaves, etc. Right? We would put it in, as I said, to poverty, to war, to slavery. We would put it into hunger. We would put it into disease. Why? How, how would all these things come about? Well, what happened in the late 18th, mid 19th century? 
We had the industrial age, okay? Beginning in the late 17th century, we, be, we had the beginning of the, so late 17th century, you have the beginning of what's called the Enlightenment. What is that, what does the idea even imply? I can't turn these lights off. All right, can't over here, but not easily. That prior to that period, everybody was dark up here. How so? They didn't operate according to reason. They didn't operate according to logic. They didn't operate according to rationality. They operated according to what? Faith, belief, stuff like that. So the Enlightenment put this emphasis on reason, on knowledge, on facts, etc. Okay? Mid 19th century, a biologist publishes a little book, 1859 to be exact publishes it after he goes on a trip on a sailing vessel. And on that trip, they stop at the Galapagos Islands. Who am I talking about? Charles Darwin. What's the book? Origin of Species. Okay. And Darwin essentially comes up with the theory that everything evolves through time, including us, and we have evolved from primates. We are the highest form of primate, but etc. Okay? So you get the rise of evolution, etc. What goes along simultaneously with the emphasis on reason, the emphasis on science, the emphasis on evolution? There is a fall in the emphasis on faith, belief, and religion. Whatever religion. I'm not talking about just Christian, just kind of whatever religion. According to those who consider themselves, you know, the knowledgeable ones, the, the leaders of the world, etc. Okay? So it's that emphasis on science and knowledge and reason that creates these two ideas. That with science, we can do what? We can put an end to disease. With science, with reason, we can put an end to War, because what essentially, typically, often causes war? Hunger, poverty, they have what I want, and I don't have what I want, so I'm going to go take what they have. But the idea is, with the industrial age, we can produce more stuff so I can have what I want, and they can have what they want. Okay? What happens? Not even a decade and a half into that nirvana mentality. The Great War. <laughs> the war to end all wars. A war like has never been seen before. Okay? Because prior to this, wars tended to be between one or two. There were a few where there were some larger kind of geopolitical forces. The Crimean War in the 1860s pitted Russia against Great Britain, the Austrian-Hungarian Hungarian Empire. Okay, so there you kind of start that. So these ideas kind of get squashed. Then you get the Roaring Twenties. Economy's booming, everything's going great. Depression happens. Then we get the Second World War. Okay, And during the Second World War, a couple of famous Frenchmen come up with an idea, and they kind of do it simultaneously. It's not unique to them, however. This idea had been around a little bit earlier, but the idea is existentialism. The Frenchmen are um, Albert Camus and... John Paul Sartre, okay? Or Albert Camus and John Paul Sartre, if you want. It's not how they pronounce the names, but the idea is existentialism. This idea is prominent in higher education, in literature, in the arts, 
among what are called the conoscenti, that is, the, the enlightened, the intellectuals, okay? From the late 30s, oh, through the early 70s. And existentialism, essentially, and there, there are many branches of it. There are Christian existentialists, there are atheist existentialists, there are your just garden variety. Existentialists, or existentialism, as taught by these two, essentially said these few things. One, there's no meaning to life. That's the big, that's the first point. There is no meaning to your existence. Okay? That's because, for Camus and Sartre, Sartre, two, there is no God. There's nothing after death. You die, that's it. Your body disintegrates. What you thought of as your soul doesn't really exist. That's just electrons flying around in your mind, giving you this awareness of consciousness. You die, that awareness is gone, that's it. Okay? All this happens completely because of chance. Okay? So those are the three big aspects to it. No meaning, no supernatural, total chance, right? Now, this can become, this idea can become very harsh, or it can be softened. As I said, there can be, there are Christian existentialists who don't take the second point. There is no God. They don't accept that. But they do say, because of some other things existentialists said, which I'll talk about in a moment, that you can be a Christian and you can be an existentialist. Here's how. Because the existentialist said, because there's no meaning to your life, you have to make that meaning. You have to make your life meaningful. How do you do that? The term they used is you have to authenticate your existence. You have to be the author of your life. Well, duh. Right? Do you have somebody else writing your script for you? Do you, do you really follow orders of somebody else? No. Nobody does. Well, some do, but not many. Okay? So what they mean by that is that authenticating your existence, making the world know Allie Falk lived when she dies. So that after she's dead, others will say, not I knew that person, but that person lived. That person, what do we all kind of think? What do most people think? Most people want others to know about them after they died. Made a difference. Made a difference. Well, you can make a difference a lot of different ways, right? You could be like the 17-year-old kid in the Crimea. And where's the Crimea? It's over there between Turkey and Russia. It's a little peninsula that Russia invaded and took control of a couple years ago. 17-year-old kid went to his college with a shotgun and killed 18 people. There's video of him and going down a hallway. Okay. Do people know he and then he killed himself? Do people know he existed? Yep. We might not very much here in the United States, but you can be damn sure in Crimea they do. Do we all know Osama bin Laden lived? Hitler lived? Stalin lived? Yes, we do. Okay. Mother Teresa, because let's let's pull a good one in. Yeah. Mother Teresa, yes. Okay, Pick your other good ones, whatever, because I've got colleagues who would say, Mother Teresa's as bad as Bin Laden. I think they're wacko, but you know, that's another point. So how can you validate your existence? You can be the Boy Scout who helps the little old lady across the street, stops her from running out into the big semi that's pulling out, or you can push her in front of it. It doesn't matter how 
you validate your existence. Why? Because ultimately, there is no outside external source for morality. That is, morality is totally relative. Now, it can be relative to you as an individual, or it can be relative to your culture, your nation, etc. What's an example? The modern, the real world, this is going on today, an example of this kind of thing, where most people in the United States would say, this action is culturally, morally wrong. And in other countries, it is taken to not only be right, but it is morally, culturally, religiously justified. Everybody know what that stands for? Female genital mutilation. That is appropriate, quote unquote, in some cultures. We kind of think, no, because the females that it's happening to, they don't have a choice in that matter. Okay? Well, what else? If you take this relative is idea seriously and literally, and you accept it, then what does that say, what does that mean one country can say about another country's whatever, their morality? Nothing. Nothing. Because what might be wrong for us might be right for somebody else. What, in your deepest innermost sense, what tells you that is that idea on its face is wrong? If it does, how about this? Hitler was right. Hitler was right for Hitler and for the Germans. Now, most people would say, I can't believe you even said that. If I were to say that in some classes, I would be getting, or at some schools, I would be getting letters from the dean, the provost, the president. I would be having calls for me to be fired, okay? Because it sounds like I'm saying, you know, Heil Hitler. It's not what I'm saying. If this is right, then I have no basis to say Hitler was wrong for what he did, or Stalin was wrong for what he did. Because what Stalin did compared to Hitler made Hitler look like a kindergartner. Hitler killed six million Jews and probably another two to three million gays, lesbians, gypsies, Christians, cripples. I'll use loaded language. Okay? Stalin is responsible for what? The estimate is 60 to 100 million. Excuse me, 20 to 60 million Russians dead. Okay. Primarily, let's get all current, Ukrainians. Ukrainians. Why? He starved them. Okay. Mao in China. Pol Pot, Cambodia. Nobody, I don't think I've seen anybody in here this semester wear one of these t-shirts. I have before in other classes. Che Guevara. <laughs> you know, he's supposed to be all cool and hipsterish. The guy was a murderous thug, responsible for the death of tens of thousands. Castro. Okay? Same thing. But this is true, hey, that's fine, all right? So these are the ideas swirling through the intellectual atmosphere at the time that she is writing this. It's going to be only a few years after she writes this in 1966, I think, that Time Magazine puts on its cover, God is Dead. 
Okay. Why did they put that on the cover? One, they're a little bit out of date. They weren't the first ones to say that. A guy named Friedrich N I E T Z S C H N. Friedrich Nietzsche, German philosopher, 19th century, said it first. He said, God is dead and we had killed him. How did we kill him? Don't need him anymore. Why? Because we have the rise of science and technology and knowledge and reason, etc. Okay? He is the father of what you could call, I think, the extreme branch of existentialism, which is nihilism. Which is not only, this is why it's the extreme branch. Remember, existentialism said, you have no meaning to your life. So you have to create your meaning to your life. Nietzsche said, guess what? You can't. No matter what, you have no meaning. I don't think it's coincidental that he went insane late in life. Okay? Because if you take this idea seriously, and you believe it, and you take it to its logical consequence, what does that mean one should do? If life is totally meaningless, if there is nothing worthwhile about it, why, as Hamlet said, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the proud man's contumely, the all the crap we go... Why go through all that? Why not just end it all? Or go back to the 17-year-old in Crimea. Why not end it all for yourself? But like the Columbine shooters, because the little manifestos they left behind proved these guys were dyed in the wool nihilists. And they're going to go out with a bang. Why? Because the only thing you've got going for you is that people knew you were here. Okay? Now that's going to tie in with our character of the misfit. So, now go to this little snippet of a letter O'Connor wrote in 1955. She wrote this and I don't remember if I put the longer form of the letter on the D2L side or not. I will. If I haven't. She wrote this to a woman who wrote to her. A woman was, was not a Christian. O'Connor is. O'Connor's Catholic. Okay. First of all, imagine being Catholic in South Georgia in the 1950s. It's almost as bad as being Jewish or Muslim. Okay, because I mean stinking ring kissing papist kind of a thing if you're a good Southern Baptist, okay, in the 1950s, not necessarily today. So she's Catholic, and this woman writes to her, and she's not a believer. But she's kind of feeling like she ought to be, okay? And that the church is kind of hounding her. So she kind of asks her, why, why do you write the stories the way you do? O'Connor writes, page 467. I write the way I do because, not though, I am a Catholic. What does the because, not though, mean? That because, that's telling us her Catholicism informs. It's kind of like the bedrock of everything she writes. It's the foundation. The not though would mean if you took that and took out the because, would imply, you know, I kind of can't help it. I'm, I'm sorry. She's not apologizing for being a Catholic. She's kind of saying, well, if you don't like it. <laughs> this is a fact and nothing covers it like the bald statement. So she goes on. However, I'm a Catholic peculiar, peculiarly possessed of the modern consciousness. What is that modern consciousness? Everything I've just been talking about. Existentialism, the nihilism, etc., going around through the intellectual ether. To possess this, this modern consciousness, okay, which is again, life is meaningless, 
You have to somehow make meaning of your existence. And many people say you can't make any meaning of your existence. And that's it. You, you just you live for no apparent reason and then you die. To possess this idea within the church is to bear a burden. The necessary burden for the conscious Catholic. Conscious. She means the thinking Catholic. Not the unthinking, oh, I'm Christian because I go to church a couple times a year or because I was born into a Christian home or because I was baptized, but I never really think about it. I don't really do anything. Okay? She means the conscious, the active, the thinking Christian. It's what? This is the burden for the conscious Christian. It's to feel the contemporary situation at the ultimate level. Ultimate, that is, to take all of these ideas to their logical conclusion. You want to find out if an idea is good or not? Take it to its conclusion. That is, let's take the Me Too movement. Okay? Take the Me Too movement and take it to its logical conclusion. Its logical conclusion would say, if we just take it as it is, would say what? We saw it with the Supreme Court nomination stuff. Every woman is to be believed. Period. Okay? That's the logical conclusion of that movement. What's the problem with that? Because I think everyone would admit there is a problem with that. What, as has happened, what if a woman is lying? The Duke Lacrosse case. The Virginia um, Rolling Stone story a couple years ago. Both those instances, the accusers, were lying. There's a case just the other day, a guy that had been sentenced to prison for rape, just was released after 28 years. 28 years. Why? New DNA evidence. He's attested to his innocence for 28 years. Okay? So the flaw in the argument is where? Every woman is to believe, period. What if we were to flip that on the other side? Every man is to be believed. Take that to its logical conclusion. That means take either of those to their logical conclusion, and you have problems, right? Because what's missing from both sides? Okay, people lie. What's lacking on both of those? Proof, evidence, due process, and what can evidence include in either of those? It doesn't mean if a woman is raped or if a woman accuses someone of being raped, it doesn't mean that if she's raped, she automatically has to, the very next hour, you know, go to the police or go to a hospital. What can be included as evidence? She tells her best friend. She tells her parents. She tells her husband. She tells somebody, you know. It's that kind of contemporaneous. Okay? So, to take whatever the idea is to its ultimate conclusion, she's saying here, she feels the contemporary situation at its ultimate level. She takes all of this, take it to its ultimate conclusion. Life has no meaning. What can that result in people doing? Columbine. Okay. Virginia Tech massacre a dozen years ago. Because if you accept all this, if there is no, and I'm not saying there is, I'm just saying if you remove it totally from the equation, if there's no quote unquote afterlife, no system of reward and punishment, okay, then what does that remove from some people? All inhibition, right? Okay, so. 
I think that the church is the only thing that is going to make the terrible world we are coming to endurable. Notice, the world isn't already totally terrible. She says, it's coming to. I don't know if she means coming to like in the 1950s, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 2018. But she says it's only the church that will make that endurable. How? The only thing that makes the church endurable is that it is somehow the body of Christ and that on this we are fed. That is, the church kind of um, corporately thought of is the body of Christ. We're not going to go into the, into the theology. And then she goes on and says, um, and it seems to be a fact that you suffer as much from the church. Okay, this is before the church and the pedophile problem. I mean, the pedophile problem is going on at this time. It's just not in the news. Uh, it seems to be a fact that you suffer as much from the church as for it, but if you believe in the divinity, in the divinity of Christ, you have to cherish the world at the same time that you struggle to endure it. Okay. This is the point I want to get to in this second part of the letter. Why do you have to cherish the world if you believe in the divinity of Christ? What does that even mean? First of all, the divinity of Christ. Jesus, according to classical Christian theology, is what? The God man. Why? Totally man, totally God, simultaneously. Okay? The God who became man. What is man? What is humanity? What are we composed of? Stuff, flesh, matter. God? Not matter. Spirit. So, what she's implying by that is when God became man, again, according to traditional theology, what happens? Stuff get sanctified. That is, any thing can become a vehicle of grace. Why? Because this became a vehicle, a thing to bring grace. That's why she says, we have to cherish the world. You know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the world there doesn't refer to earth. The Greek that's used there is cosmos. Like Carl Sagan's old TV series, the cosmos. Everything, that is the whole universe. And if there are more than one, all of them. Okay? So you have to cherish the world at the same time you struggle to endure it. Right? Because it's not a picture. It's not all happy games. This may explain the lack of bitterness in the stories. That is, in her stories. Right? Now, you can read the next letter. We're not going to, but she wrote that um, comment about exaggeration and distortion because people are like, man, this woman, this, this woman is weird. Because she's got all these freaks in her stories. Literal freaks. Okay? Why? Because she says she has to use those freaks to break people out of their complacency. She's got to use things to shock people. Okay? Well, what kind of things does she use? The misfit. She says in that passage... Again, writing in the 50s, she says, most of my readers have no real awareness or understanding of quote-unquote Christianity. They don't understand a baptismal image, so she has to exaggerate and distort it. Why? To make it work for them, because most of her readers, they're not average, ordinary people. They are quote-unquote the intelligentsia, the intellectuals, the elite. And for her, that means, because she had a Master of Arts, she went to, she went to uh, University of Iowa, attended the preeminent writing school in the country, writing program. 
She lived in New York for a while with a group of other writing artists. She, she, she understood the egghead mentality perfectly. She said, most of these people don't have any understanding of Christianity. So she's got to shock them. Go to the beginning of the story with the uh, eight, fifth, 13 minutes we have left. 12 minutes we have left. So who are the characters? We have Grandma, Bailey, Mrs. Bailey, because she's never named, Baby, John Wesley, June Star. One, two, three, four, five, six people. Okay? When the story opens, what are they getting ready to do? They're going to go on a road trip. Okay, now keep in mind, this is 1953. This is before the United States had what? Our interstate. The interstate system. Dwight D. Eisenhower starts the interstate system in 55, 56. Okay? So when they're leaving Atlanta, Georgia, they're not getting on 75. They're getting on 305, 295, something like that, and heading south. Okay? <clears throat> and notice, first paragraph. She says, now look here, Bailey. See here, read this. Here this fellow calls himself the misfit, is loose from the federal pen, headed toward Florida. You were here when it says either of these people. I wouldn't take my children in any direction with a criminal like that loose in it. What has she just done? Foreshadow. Major foreshadowing. Okay? Bailey doesn't look up from his reading. Why not? Okay, doesn't think it would happen to him. Why else? Why? He's learned how to drown her out. Okay. Notice, she lives with them. Okay. This is going to be important, I think, later on. So, we get the mother's the Bailey's wife described, the children's mother, a young woman in slacks, face was as broad and innocent as a cabbage. Ladies, how would you like to have your face described as broad and innocent as a cabbage? A vegetable, in other words, okay? And the grandmother says, children have been to Florida before. Y'all ought to take them somewhere else for a change so they would see different parts of the world be broad. You ain't never been to East Tennessee. Woohoo! You know, I, I mentioned that to one of my kids the other day, and they took it exactly as I wanted to take it. Really? East Tennessee? That's being broad? That's an enlightening them to the world? Well, if they've never been there from Georgia, kind of. Gatlinburg. That's yeah, and this is even before Gatlinburg is Gatlinburg, so to speak, you know? So, children's mother didn't seem to hear. Why? The grandmother comes across, kind of comes across, if you're familiar with the old Charlie Brown cartoons that, you know, every now and then on TV, exactly, right? Wah, 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 wah. Probably what a lot of you, you know, are hearing right now. Wah, 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 as you're checking phones. And, and what happens? John Wesley, if you don't want to go to Florida, why don't you stay at home? She wouldn't stay at home and eat queen for a day, says June Star. What does this tell us about these two wonderful, well-adjusted little children? Right. Ray, why the look on your face? You kind of went. <laughs> They're disrespectful. That's a nice, polite way of putting it. Let's put it in a not so nice, polite way. Brats. They're little brats who need to be smacked. Okay. <laughs> yes, I did practice corporal punishment on all four of my kids. <laughs> it's the best thing I ever did for them. <laughs> They're, they are out and out brats. How many of you, if you had a living grandmother, if you spoke like that to your grandmother, would still be alive today? Yeah. My grandmother was a little frail old woman. She would have headlocked me and 
if my mom or dad had. You know. So, the next morning, they're ready to go. Notice, Grandma doesn't want to go to Florida, but she's the first one in the car. Okay? She has her valise, her suitcase in, and underneath it, she has a basket with what in it? The cat named Pity Sink. Why is she bringing the damn cat? I say that because we've got a kitten and it wakes me up every night about 2.30 in the morning. Doesn't want to leave him alone for three days? Cat might do what? Turn on the gas burner. House blows up. We've had to start locking our cooktop every night because the cat gets up and walks across the, and has actually turned it on once. Okay. Yeah. So she sits in the middle of the back seat between John Wesley and Jim Starr. What do these cars not have, by the way? Okay, AC. Eh, they might. I don't think so. We don't get the impression that Bailey is wealthy. Seat belts. Seat belts don't get introduced to cars until about 1957. Right? So she sits down, she removes her white gloves, puts them up on the shelf behind the seats, still wearing her straw hat, navy blue dress, small white dot. Why? Case of an accident, top of 428. Anyone seeing her dead on the highway would know at once what? She was a lady. That she was a lady. Okay, if you're dead, does it really matter anymore? I mean, I remember you used to being told, you know, before we go on a long drive, make sure you put on clean underwear. Why? In case there's an accident, you get taken to the hospital. Because then at least you're still alive and you might be embarrassed. But if you're dead, who? Well, according to this kind of idea, if all you have going for is what other people think of you, then that's important. But notice again the foreshadowing. So they drive, the boy says, about a third of the way down. Let's go through Georgia fast so we don't have to look at it much. Grandmother, if I were a little boy, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee is the mountains. Georgia has hills. He's like, it's a freaking deal, you know. Tennessee is just a hillbilly dumping ground. And Georgia is a lousy state, too. Now, where do you think little John Wesley gets that, those ideas from? Do little children, because we're not told, but he's probably not older than 10 or so. Maybe he's eight, okay. Where do they get their ideas from? Parents? Where else? Maybe grandma. Maybe grandma, but I mean, no, she doesn't sound like she gets, she gets it from her. Friends? Do eight-year-olds read newspapers? No. Not usually. Comics? Okay. But friends, family, what's the other major place? School. Grandmother. In my time, Children are more respectful of their native states and their parents and everything else. Oh, rats. <laughs> People did right then. And then what comes right immediately out of her mouth? Oh, look at the cute little pickaninny. She said and pointed to a Negro child standing in the door of a shack. Wouldn't that make a picture now? They all turned and they looked at the little boy. Junestar, he didn't have any breeches on. Grandmother probably didn't have any. Little niggers in the country don't have things like we do. If I could paint, I'd paint that picture. Why? Why would she paint the picture of the little naked black kid standing in the doorway? Go back to what she said just before then. In my time. She wants to paint a picture of this. Why? She wants to freeze time. This is how things are supposed to be. Grandma a little bit racist? <laughs> okay, we would say so. Would they say so in 1953? Probably not as much. There would be some who would. Okay. 
Children exchange comic books. Grandma offers to hold the baby. They pass a cotton field with five or six graves in the middle of it. More foreshadowing. Okay? The grandmother, look at the graveyard. That was the old family burying ground. That belonged to the plantation. John Wesley, where's the plantation? Gone with the wind. <laughs> no. Horrible novel, not a bad movie. <laughs> so, she tells them a story. And what's the story about? An old love of hers. They stop at the tower for barbecue. The tower's in Atlanta. So they're probably going from the north side of Atlanta. They've driven through. They stop at the tower. And we get introduced to Red Sammy. Bottom of 429. They go inside to eat. And Red Sammy's wife says, ain't she cute? Would you like to come be my little girl? No, I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't live in a broken down place like this for a million bucks. Ain't she cute? <laughs> Grandma, aren't you ashamed? Red Sammy comes in. And we'll stop with this. You can't win. These days, you don't know who to trust. Okay? We'll pick up there on Tuesday. If there's a quiz on Tuesday, just over um, all of a good man is hard to find. Not Tuesday, Monday, sorry. <laughs>